Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Melissio was shocked when he saw Gennaro. He immediately rushed towards him, firmly shook his hand, embraced him, and gave him a friendly pat on the shoulder. After his close friend had gone abroad, Melesio Gil didn't expect to see him so soon. Wow, what a surprise! Melesio exclaimed. The young man had recently taken over his father's business. Since his father regularly took him to work, involving him in business affairs, Melesio quickly grasped the ropes. The company thrived under his management. Both Malesio and Gennaro attended the same private school and later inherited their father's businesses. Look at you, all grown up. Hitting the gym, right? Gennaro asked, patting him on the shoulder. I actually came home for a few months. I don't really like being abroad. I'll probably return home. That's enough traveling for me, Malesio replied. Wow, one piece of good news after another. You really made my day, Gennaro. I'm so glad you're staying. They sat down at a large table as soon as the secretary brought coffee. She reminded them about the contract that he needed to sign today and then left them alone. Is it true you're planning to marry Clara Ramos? Women like Clara are good for flings, but marrying them is not a wise move, Gennaro said. You sound like my mother, Melesio waved him off. Well, maybe you should listen to your loved ones. I genuinely care about you, like a brother. I don't want you to fall into the trap of another girl who thinks she's a great seductress. I just want you to be happy, and believe me, there's something off about this Clara. She's not reliable. Melesio wasn't paying much attention to his friend. He often had doubts about the sincerity of his fiancée, and his mother constantly nagged him. But Melesio himself didn't know if the desire to test his fiancée's sincerity was his own or if he was succumbing to the pressure from those around him. It's too early for you to get married. You still have so many things to do ahead. Then there's the wedding, kids. Do you think it's easy when you have kids? No. If you're an average Basilio who abandons his wife and kids, there's no difference. If you're like me, a full-fledged parent, then it's not that simple. I love my daughter to bits, but there are a lot of problems with kids. Enjoy the quiet and peaceful life while you can, Gennaro said, laughing. They talked about business, relocation, and foreign currency accounts. It was just like old times, friendly conversation mixed with business matters. Melesio enjoyed the pleasant time he spent with someone he could trust. After work, he decided to visit his mother. She was supposed to hand over some documents to him that he hadn't yet transferred to his name. Lately, catching her at home could be considered lucky. Haven't you changed your mind yet? The woman asked. Marcelina looked about 10 years younger than her age in her passport. It wasn't due to plastic surgery. She had never undergone any of them. Marcelina always claimed that her youthfulness was a result of avoiding stress, no matter how nightmarish life became. She tightly hugged her son, literally forcing him onto the makeshift table, which was a bar counter when there were few guests. Melesio settled into a high bar stool, taking a coffee cup from his mother's hands. The hazelnut foam was as delicious as ever. For some reason, hazelnut lattes were always associated with home for him. I recently saw Clara. Melesio, don't you want to test her somehow? I don't like how she behaves. She doesn't seem like a sincere girl. I'm more than sure she doesn't love you. She's only after your money. With your wealth, you need to be very careful about who you're planning to marry, his mother said. Mom, why is everyone nagging me about this? Gennaro was lecturing me about her today too. Gennaro is smarter than you, by the way. And anyway, do you really believe Clara 100%? Melesio pondered, he couldn't even gather half of the mentioned percentage if he dug deeper. Clara behaved oddly, and there were always quirks to latch onto in her strange habits. There was always a chance that Clara was playing the role of an infatuated girl only for money. On the other hand, maybe she was just sociable, stubborn, and private on her own, with no ulterior motives in her actions. The words about testing Clara for infidelity planted a seed of doubt in him. 
Melesio knew his own nature. If doubt arose, it would continue to grow. Think about it. She quit her job as soon as you started living together. Clung to you, and before you know it, she might take control over you, his mother said. You know I'm not against it. Of course, you're not. She's just messing with your brain, that's all, his mother insisted. Deep down, Melesio understood that his mother was right. He shouldn't have jumped in at the deep end. He needed to first check Clara's intentions. Melesio decided not to think about it for now. He returned to the apartment. Clara was already home, walking on tiptoes, showcasing a new dress she had snagged at a designer sale. Melesio nodded and praised another piece of clothing that he saw no point in. Clara showed him a new crimson manicure and then quickly went to the kitchen. When Nalesio entered, he saw more plastic boxes from a restaurant. Maybe it was time to eat his mother's home-cooked food. It was better than the usual restaurant fare. By the way, Clara was an excellent cook, but once they started living together, she gained access to his card and stopped cooking altogether. Considering she had quit her job, devoting a couple of hours to cooking wouldn't be difficult. However, every time he brought it up, Clara just rolled her eyes. What do you think? Maybe we should have the wedding in Italy? I talked to a manager today, and she says it's entirely possible. It will be a bit more expensive, of course, Clara said, shrugging her shoulders. No, we'll have the wedding here, Melesio insisted. She rolled her eyes, displaying her displeasure. He no longer fell for her manipulations. She got a notification on her phone. Melesio saw emojis in the shape of hearts and frowned. Clara quickly grabbed the phone, saying it was her friend's. This wasn't the first time he caught her with such a hasty excuse. Once, he caught her talking at night on the balcony. Melesio woke up as he heard her talking to someone on the phone. It wasn't entirely audible, but who would go out on the balcony for a phone call in the winter? That was when his first doubt surfaced, but he chose not to voice them. Whenever he hinted at his jealousy or suspicions, Clara would flare up, ready for a quarrel. You seem completely uninterested, she remarked. I just think you don't consider that our guests can't just fly to Italy on the date we want. We're not having this wedding just for ourselves, in case you forgot. You'd better take care of the invitations, Melesio said. And, overall, I think we should postpone the wedding for a few months. Clark stared at him with wide eyes. She didn't understand what this decision was based on. She smirked. Is this some kind of joke? Are you seriously suggesting we postpone the wedding? Aren't you afraid I won't marry you at all then? Clark said accusingly. Resentment literally oozed from her. He rolled his eyes, simply mimicking her gesture, one she loved to use. Clara snorted but didn't say anything more. Apparently, she wasn't in the mood for a quarrel. When Clara went to take a shower, Melesio went through all her messages but found nothing suspicious. This didn't mean she was honest with him. She could delete everything with a single swipe. The next day, Clara behaved as if nothing had happened, as if there were no talks of postponing the wedding. She smiled, fluttered around him, and talked about the luxurious dress she had spotted. Something in her behavior seemed strange and suspicious to him. Perhaps he truly felt her insincerity from within, or maybe the advice of others clouded his mind. On the day Teresa came to the office, Melesio was completely immersed in his thoughts. Teresa, his ex-girlfriend, was a businesswoman. Long ago, when they were dating, he helped her prepare documents to open her business. Melesio strongly doubted her business acumen back then, but now, watching her run a business, he admired her perseverance. Melesio, tell me, are you planning to get married? Teresa asked with a sly smile. It seems you're thinking about the wedding all the time. Teresa laughed, and Melesio chuckled as well. They had almost gotten married back then, but they realized in time that they were still too young. They would have a divorce. They broke up on a positive note, simply realizing that they no longer loved each other and were living like neighbors. Their relationship had always been more of a friendship than a romantic one. Okay, it's not my business, of course, but I know your girl. 
If my memory serves me right, she had affairs with all the local businessmen. She looks like a predator. Be careful, Melesio, Teresa warned. Teresa, come on. Almost everyone I meet tells me she's not the best choice for marriage. I think you all just don't know her well, Melesio shrugged. I won't insist, it's not my concern. I actually wanted to talk to you about the business transfer. I'm moving the entire business abroad and would like to clarify the operations of our joint branches that we opened together back then. Remember? I'll probably transfer them to you in exchange for a percentage. If you agree now, I'll talk to my lawyers and we'll settle it soon, Teresa said. The conversation shifted entirely to business matters. Melesio reviewed the documents and the situation was acceptable to him, with him taking over management and giving her a percentage. However, what disappointed him was Teresa's decision to permanently move abroad. Apparently, Gennaro's experience had no effect on her. As soon as Teresa left his office, she bumped into Clara in the corridor. Clara's eyebrows shot up to her forehead. She stared at her ex-boyfriend's former flame, examining her from head to toe. What the hell are you doing here? We're actually planning to get married, so you shouldn't come here, Clara snapped. Calm down, baby. We have purely business matters, although I doubt you'd understand. Your skills probably wouldn't even be enough for a business conversation, Teresa retorted. Clara couldn't stand it when Teresa flaunted her business skills. Even more, she hated it when Melesio used Teresa as an example. Clara envied Teresa greatly, but instead of honestly admitting it to herself, she clashed with this young woman every time. If you think he'll leave you for me, you're wrong. Oh, so Susano isn't with you anymore? Did Timoteo also dump you? Did Evaristo decide that you're too dumb for him? Teresa asked, counting all the businessmen Clara had dated in the last few months before Melesio. That's none of your business. And if I tell him, he won't even say hello to you anymore, Clara retorted. Teresa burst into laughter, openly mocking the girl, clearly not intending to yield to her. Teresa laughed so hard that tears welled up in her eyes. Clara was so infuriated that she couldn't influence Teresa in any way, so she stormed into her fiancé's office. Even when the door slammed shut, Clara could still hear Teresa laughing. Clara pointed demonstratively at the door. What was she doing here? Why is she coming to your office? Clara shouted. Clara, calm down. I don't need you to make a scene here too. She came to transfer part of the business. Don't make a fuss, Melesio said as calmly as possible. And couldn't you discuss such things over the phone? The girl exclaimed. Either you talk calmly now or we won't talk at all. Clara was even more astonished at how he talked to her. First, he talked about his suspicions, then shared the idea of postponing the wedding, and now his ex dropped by his office, and he refused to discuss everything properly. Clara felt a volcano of anger boiling inside her. A little more, and she would explode on him. I'm talking to you normally. It's you who have been making scenes lately, like a little girl. First, you postpone the wedding, then you suspect me of something. Do you even realize how humiliating this is for me? Everything was fine until your friends and mom started giving you advice, Melesio calmly stated, despite his visible effort to contain himself. He wanted to put her in her place once and for all, so there would be no more scandals. It irritated him that she couldn't keep herself together. At the slightest provocation, a scandal erupted, one that everyone in the vicinity could hear. I won't keep quiet. If I said you don't listen to me, then that's the way it is. Either we talk normally or I'll cancel this damn wedding, she yelled. Then cancel it, Melesio roared, banging his fist on the table. Clara lost her ability to speak. She felt as if someone had hit her on the head with a bag, and she looked at him in disbelief. She couldn't believe he didn't fall for her manipulation. Everything got even worse. She hoped he would immediately back down because she had done everything to make him lose his mind. And now Melesio simply refused the wedding as soon as she mentioned it. That's how it is, Melesio said sternly. He stood up and adjusted his jacket. 
The man straightened his back, looking directly into his bride's eyes. You turn around quietly now and go home. Think carefully about your behavior. I'll come home and we'll calmly discuss the situation. If there's any kind of scandal, I'll do as you said, cancel the wedding. I'm not going to marry a girl who creates emotional roller coasters the moment she wakes up. Go now. Clara blushed with anger so much that her face resembled a tomato. She puffed up her chest as if trying to contain a growing scream. Clara abruptly turned on her heels and stormed out of the office. Melesio sat back in his chair and placed his palms on his temples. He was so tired. On the day he came home, Clara was quiet as a lamb. He mentioned that they would visit his mother the next day, and Clara agreed without a word. Until the last moment, Clara couldn't find common ground with Marcelina. If she could win his mother's favor, the wedding would undoubtedly take place. However, every time the girl tried to find common ground with her, Marcelina bluntly rejected her. After lunch, as they were getting ready to go out of town, Clara was already preparing a speech in her mind. She planned to play the victim. She was a poor girl who fell in love, and Melesio just manipulated her. Clara repeatedly replayed the phrases in her head that she would tell Marcelina. However, when they arrived, Melesio's mother greeted her as coldly as ever. They sat at the table, had dinner, and engaged in conversation. Clara behaved meekly, below the radar. Marcelina communicated with her almost through clenched teeth. Melesio could see the tension between them escalating, but he didn't take any action. All recent situations only confirmed his mother's words. He needed to somehow test Clara for infidelity before she caused any real trouble. Besides, getting married wasn't the best decision considering their current relationship. A stamp in the passport hardly had the power to change Clara's attitude towards life and towards him in particular. Melesio stood up and went outside when he received a call. Through the window, he could see how he was sitting a few meters away on the long curb along the fountain. Why aren't you supporting me? Don't you have any female solidarity? Do you even know how you raised your son? He takes advantage of how much I love him, manipulating me. The last time he even said he could cancel the wedding, Clara said. Marcelina smirked. Her self-satisfied face irritated Clara even more. Listen, girl. If you think I'll go against my own son for some unknown girl like you, you're seriously mistaken, Marcelina quickly replied. We've been together for a long time, so I'm not that unknown. You're probably one of those mothers who can't let their sons leave the nest. You're just waiting for him to stay with you until old age. Keep your tongue shut. You haven't grown up yet to teach me about life in my own home. My son is a grown man who stands firmly on his own two feet. I never raised him as a mama's boy, but you, you appeared in his life so suddenly after sleeping with all the well-known local rich men. You just liked that he not only had money, but was also young. Luckily, my son is starting to realize that you're far from the best option, Marcelina said. Clara's eyebrows rose again. She looked at Marcelina in surprise, who demonstratively avoided eye contact. The woman poured herself half a glass of wine, sat on a high bar stool, took a sip, and closed her eyes. I've been in this world for too long, and believe me, dear, you're taking on too much. You might think you're so smart, a master manipulator, and a great seductress. But believe me, Clara, for people like me, everything is clear about you. My son will grow up and understand that he did the right thing when he declined to marry you. And something tells me that there won't be a wedding between you two. If you're accusing me of something, then say it straight, insisted Clara. She demonstratively shouted this phrase as Melesio entered the house. She wanted to show that Marcelina was simply turning Melesio against his fiance, but instead, she only planted more doubts in her fiance's mind. Oh, Lord, you can't even go without your manipulations here. Listen, dear, I never hid my feelings towards you. I believe you're marrying my son only for money. I can say it to your face privately or right in front of him, Marcelina declared. And you're just going to leave it at that? Clara shouted, staring at Melesio. Melesio looked at his mother wearily. 
She just shrugged, as if she had done nothing, making it clear that this joint dinner wouldn't end well. Melesio sat at the table, pretending nothing had happened. Once again, he discussed with his mother the idea of selling the seaside house and putting two plots, left untouched, up for sale. Clara opened her mouth in surprise that her outrage had gone unnoticed. Marcelina behaved as if Clara didn't exist. Clara was angry but didn't want to provoke further conflicts. Who knew? Maybe Melesio was still considering postponing the wedding. Clara refused to think that Melesio might entirely cancel the celebration. She had to make concessions just to avoid hurting his feelings and triggering the wrong assumptions. That evening, they returned home without exchanging a word. Clara locked herself in the bathroom, likely spending a whole hour in the bath filled with foam and the pungent smell of pine oil. Marcelina called her son the next day and expressed everything she thought. She almost literally retold the conversation that took place in his absence. Melesio became more convinced that it was necessary to test his fiancée. Now he was sure that he wouldn't marry her until the test was over. Clara's behavior became increasingly strange. She spent hours in the bathroom, often talked on the balcony at night, hid her phone, and changed the password on it. Moreover, strange withdrawals started occurring from her bank card, although she didn't use cash. On the day when Melesio's friend showed up at the office, Melesio was already completely distraught with his feelings, constantly contemplating various ways to test his fiancée. He recounted all the recent events to his friend, but he just shrugged, as if he wasn't surprised. From the very beginning, as soon as you started dating, I warned you. I immediately said that having a relationship with a girl who dates one businessman and then another one is a foolish idea. You're an adult, you make your own decisions, but I still can't believe why you decided not just to have a serious relationship with her, but also to marry her, Gennaro replied, shaking his head negatively. He responded to a message, grabbed a mug of coffee, and returned to the leather couch. Melesio, let's think this through carefully, all right? Your mother is right. If you want to marry her, you should do it only after a thorough test. First, make sure she loves you and not your money. If she passes the test, great, go ahead and get married. Maybe we are all wrong, and you alone see the truth. Let me remind you, if the majority considers someone dishonest, it's likely true. There are exceptions, of course, but our collective instinct usually works. If a person is rotten, we can all sense it, Gennaro said. Melesio nodded but didn't delve deeply into the topic. However, he listened to a few ideas Gennaro proposed for the checks. One option was to claim that the business had collapsed and everything had to be sold. However, this story required careful preparation. Another suggestion from his mother was to involve doctors to prearrange falling into a coma. This option was much more preferable, and he could lie in bed while keeping his ears sharp. While Melesio was contemplating this option, he didn't attempt to put it into action. That evening, Melesio returned home earlier than his fiancée. He was sitting in the kitchen, drinking freshly squeezed pomegranate juice, listening to the street noise outside. Suddenly, he heard a familiar voice and almost immediately understood that it was Clara. I told you that nothing is clear yet. Everything has become so complicated that I didn't expect him to start doubting me. His mother, that woman knows no bounds at all. She doesn't understand what tact and politeness are. She makes a scene right next to him, and he endures it, never once standing up for me against his mother, Clara complained with a hurt tone. From the outside, the conversation seemed quite standard. Clara, as always, was venting to her friend over the phone, who sighed on the other end. Clara would come home, speak her friend's words, and again set conditions for him. You know it yourself. Am I supposed to do everything by myself? Actually, we came up with this together, in case you've forgotten. You know, if you think everything will go smoothly, you're sorely mistaken. Now I have to behave like a delicate flower to ensure the wedding takes place, but I can't because all of this irritates me, Clara said. Now it was clear that it wasn't her friend on the other end of the line. Melesio tensed, he mentally reminded himself that he needed to visit the doctor. 
He had to test her as soon as possible. He didn't like all these conversations and the strange behavior of his fiancée. Clara entered the apartment as if nothing had happened, mentioning that she had bought beef and would prepare a delicious dinner. She asked if he could help her chop the salad. She behaved genuinely softly, with no complaints, smiling, laughing, and not even mentioning the conversation with his mother. Something was off. Melesio went to Esteban Soto. He greeted him a little late due to the many patients ahead. Esteban was his father's friend, someone reliable even in seemingly hopeless situations. Melesio explained the family situation to the doctor. However, when he suggested intentionally putting him in a coma, Esteban refused. Are you out of your mind? It's like lying in a coffin for a joke. No one can't prank anyone like this. God doesn't forgive that, Esteban said. I'm begging you, I just need it for a couple of days. I'm sure she'll break down very quickly. Cover my eyes, lay me on the bed, and set up some four with vitamins so I lie there sick and immobile. Everything will be fine. I'll pay you well, Melesio pleaded. He was practically begging, knowing that finding another doctor who would agree to such manipulation would be extremely challenging, especially finding someone trustworthy. Anyone from the outside could easily take the fiancé's side, get more money from her, and spill the truth. I don't need money, but if you can get my nephew a job, I'll be glad. He finished his courses as a programmer with good, expensive training. But without experience, no one wants to hire him. He's a responsible guy, learns very quickly, and loves this work. He just can't find a job, Esteban said. We'll do it today, Esteban. I'll call right away. Melesio immediately pulled out his phone, dialed the HR department, scheduled an interview for the guy, and told them to take him in and assign Federico to an internship. Esteban didn't expect the situation to unfold so quickly. They discussed all the details, also preparing for unforeseen circumstances. On the same day, Esteban prepared the room and set up the four stand. They checked Melesio's general condition just in case. They indeed blindfolded him, so it wouldn't be visible that his pupils were moving, but everything else depended on Melesio. He felt the denouement was close, but was still worried that he was wasting time. When his mother found out that he had agreed to the check, she was ecstatic. She said she would play along perfectly, come with the girl herself, and see what would happen next. Melesio slowly handed over his responsibilities, delegating them to his deputy. He entrusted Gennaro to oversee the case, just in case. The check could take a few days, or it could take a whole week. Marcelina called Clara in tears and told her that Melesio had a heart attack. They brought him to the hospital, and he fell into a coma. Choking on tears, Marcelina said the situation was very bad and Clara needed to come urgently. Clara dropped everything and headed to the hospital. Marcelina was standing by her son's bed, crying and wiping away tears. Even a master of the art of acting wouldn't recognize that she was lying. Marcelina gasped for air and covered her mouth with her hands, sobbing. Clara was standing by her future fiancé, watching him from the side. She surveyed the floor and the room itself, sat in a chair, immediately dialed a phone number, and held the phone to her ear. Little did she know that Melesio could hear both her and the person on the other end of the line. Looks like we're in trouble. We didn't make it. The wedding is at risk. I have no idea what to do next. He's now in a coma, Clara snapped. What? In a coma? The man asked. Yes. Are you deaf or something? I need to talk to the doctor. Maybe there's some chance he'll pull through. Good thing we didn't get married before, or I'd be stuck with a vegetable. With a rich vegetable, the man laughed. It's not funny. Do you understand that our entire plan is falling apart right now? We shouldn't have taken such risks. We should have made everything quicker, she said. I shouldn't have listened to you. It would be better if I got pregnant, then we would have gotten married faster. She abruptly stood up, pacing around the room. He could hear her steps moving from his right to his left. And what do you suggest now? 
Why should I stay with him if nothing will change? What's the use of him lying in a hospital bed in a coma for years, possibly dying sooner or later? She went somewhere, and Melesio was left alone. He was afraid to move because he didn't know if anyone else was in the room. His old acquaintance worked in this hospital. She was supposed to come and say that no one else was there. She was the only person, besides the head doctor, who was aware of the entire situation. Meanwhile, Clara was standing outside the head doctor's office. She glanced at her watch, walked along the corridor, and grabbed her phone. Clara quickly typed a message, then sat back down on the couch. When she was invited into the head doctor's office, Clara jumped up and literally flew into the room. He stared in surprise at the disheveled girl. Esteban gestured for her to sit. Clara sat, hugged her bag to her knees, and glared at the phone too much. The head doctor worked with people for a long time. He could literally determine the person in front of him by their face. Honestly, despite external beauty, he would never marry such a girl. It was evident what kind of character she had, and he clearly wouldn't want a life partner who could betray him at any moment. What's the chance out of a hundred that he'll recover? Clara asked. Honestly, I can't give it any chance. It's probably one percent out of a hundred that he'll come to his senses. Believe me, the brain damage there is severe. As a doctor, I shouldn't say this, but even if he wakes up, it won't end well. Most likely, he'll be immobile and won't be able to return to his normal life, Esteban said. So, due to a heart attack, a person can fall into a coma and then end up an invalid? Clara asked skeptically. Clara, are you questioning my decision? Contrary to common belief, a person's body is very fragile, cardiac arrest, heart attacks, all of this can affect the brain and its parts. Sometimes, a part of it dies, and it's beyond recovery. Trust me, if I start explaining the biological mechanisms to you, you'll fall asleep in a few minutes. He will never come out of the coma in the same condition, and I can give you my medical guarantee on that, Esteban said. He hoped that after these words, Clara would get up and leave the room, but she continued to sit in the chair, looking at her own hands and occasionally glancing at her phone. She nervously tapped her foot, examining the office. When Clara spoke again, her lips trembled. And now? Is there a very small chance he'll come out of the coma, and if he does, he won't be a normal person anymore, right? Am I right? He will remain the same person, but most likely, he'll lose motor activity. He will be disabled, or, in the worst case, turn into a vegetable. I know couples who didn't fall apart under the pressure of diseases. That's not for you to decide, Clara snapped. She stood up and left the office, leaving Esteban alone. The man stood up, left the office, and went downstairs. He entered the room and locked it with the key in his pocket. He looked closely at his room. Esteban announced that it was him, no one else was in the room, and he relayed the conversation with Clara in as much detail as possible. The man lay on the bed and couldn't believe he had experienced all of this. He almost married a girl who was ready to reject him. Melesio expected that it would take a few days for her to leave, and then he would find out that she decided to stay with him, that she loved him and wanted to be with him regardless of his condition. But it turned out that a few hours were enough for the test. Esteban sympathized with Malesio, but he was sure that everything was already on the surface. Thank you for giving my boy a job. He's happy to work at your company. If you endure him for half a year for him to gain experience, I'll be immensely grateful to you, the doctor said with a warm smile. I've already heard good things about him. I'll be glad to have such an employee on a permanent basis, Malesio smiled. Melesio, understand me right. When your dad got married, I was happy. Marcelina is a wonderful woman who never holds a grudge against anyone. You can go through thick and thin with her. They lived soul to soul for so many years that their souls never doubted each other. It's the perfect example of a family, Melesio. And if someone only wants money from you, what's the point of regretting losing such a person? Maybe you should just be happy? Esteban asked. You're right about that, Melesio said. Melesio remained alone. 
He knew that now no one would let anyone else in. He could calmly remove the bandage and just wait for instructions. If, during the visit, the bride appeared, he would lie back on the bed as if nothing had happened. When his mother arrived, Melesio was ready to tell her everything. But when he saw Marcelina's face, it immediately became clear that something extraordinary had happened. She breathed heavily, clearly very angry. Marcelina bit her lips in anger, as always when she restrained negative emotions. She's such a wretch. Can you imagine? I decided to come to your place, thinking I'd visit her, have a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and think there's something human in her. Back then, I thought we were all against her for no reason. Maybe she was just scared. It's a bit shameful. What if she really loves you and we rebelled against her like that? The mother exclaimed quickly. Marcelina began pacing from side to side. It felt like she was measuring the room in steps, just like Clara. Due to his association with Clara, the man immediately recalled the conversation that took place between his fiancée and a suspicious man. Of course, it was necessary to find out everything in more detail, but this was enough to cancel the wedding. I come there, and she's not there. Can you imagine that she packed her things, left a terrible mess behind, and vanished? She's an awful person. I'm sure she even stole something. I thought I'd talk to her like a human and discuss what to do next. Maybe she was just scared? And this girl just packed her things and disappeared, as if you were never in her life, Marcelina yelled. Melesio recounted the conversation that took place between Clara and a man. His mother sighed heavily and slumped into a chair, which immediately seemed terribly uncomfortable to her. She looked at her son with some melancholy, as if it could comfort him. Marcelina shook her head negatively. Well, if you want, I'll find out who it is. If you haven't forgotten, I have quite decent connections with your father. God, how good it is that we decided to test her. I'm afraid to imagine what would have happened if you got married, the mother said. At first, I was very upset, but then the doctor told me something important. He's right, there's no need to be upset about those who were originally liars. But something tells me, Mom, that there's something more here, as if she needed more than just money. Money and status, my dear. She immediately changed her social circle when you started dating. And anyway, Melesio, you can't give her a single chance. You need to find her and make a scene. She must know her place, the mother sharply retorted. Melesio himself hoped to find his former fiance within a few days and talk to her, exposing everything. Melesio hoped to learn the truth and not be too disappointed. Suddenly, there might be something more behind all this than just a pursuit of money. It's frustrating to realize that someone agreed to marry you only because you have money. They talked with his mother for about half an hour. She promised to pick him up in a few days, as soon as he said so. Melesio was already looking forward to returning to work, dealing with contracts, and going to meetings. For now, he just wanted to stay calm and maintain a rational approach. He needed to think about how to have a conversation with the person who so callously left him in a difficult moment. Ada entered the room. By then, Melesio had already started packing his things. He was focused on his problem, still unsure how to talk to his ex-fiancé. He told Ada everything. They used to be close friends, but then Melesio's father started a business, earned good money, and the family moved to a good neighborhood. Since then, Melesio and Ada have communicated less and then reduced their communication to zero. But after this meeting, Melesio realized how much he had missed her all this time. They talked and laughed. It felt like it all flowed naturally. However, Melesio was too engrossed in his own thoughts that morning. He hoped that his fiancé would show up again. There was a glimmer of hope that Clara would at least call his mother, but the miracle didn't happen. Ada sympathized with him, but didn't know what to say. Maybe you shouldn't be so upset? Ada said when Melesio was already standing by the door. Melesio stopped and turned to her. In the soft light of the hospital lamp, she seemed even more beautiful to him. He had once been in love with her, but never managed to confess. Melesio smiled when he thought about it. I thought we loved each other. 
I believed we had a future. She left me at the first sign of trouble. Shouldn't I be upset? Melesio asked, breaking down everything that had happened. What's the point of getting upset? What does it change besides ruining your mood? Melesio, you have to understand that there are no perfect people in this world. Sometimes difficulties, problems, and collapses happen. It's not just happening for no reason, it's given to us so that we can understand the nature of people. Maybe you should be glad you found out everything early? Ada's words were wise. Melesio nodded, walked into the corridor, and strolled along the long white row of wards. He descended the stairs and immediately turned towards the parking lot. He wanted to get behind the wheel of his car, but for the sake of credibility, the car remained near the office. Marcelina was already standing near her car, smoking and talking on the phone. She waved to her son, pointed to the car, but stayed in her place. I'll be there in a moment, Marcelina said with her lips only. Melesio got into the car, looking forward to returning home. The apartment would become much emptier and lifeless without Clara's things. Why didn't Clara even try to give him a chance? He never refused her anything, he did everything for their future. Recently, they had arguments, and he even suggested postponing or canceling the wedding. But that's not a reason to leave him alone like a disabled man. Finally. Okay, let's go home. I'm terribly tired. Jacinto called and suggested moving my spot to the center. Can you imagine? Mother talked about her small business that she managed for pleasure. She had enough money not to worry about her financial well-being. She engaged in this business to have fun and enjoy the process. At any moment, she could drop everything, hand over the affairs to the deputy, and go abroad to relax. Marcelina pretended that nothing had happened, but when the car finally stopped near the multi-story building where Melesio lived, the woman suddenly looked at her son reproachfully. He knew she would start talking about warning him about Clara's antics. I've been thinking. Clara, of course, behaved disgustingly, but maybe you shouldn't pursue her. She's just a silly girl who didn't even realize what she was doing. Consider that she lost a good life when she left you. So maybe this will be the biggest punishment for her? Marcelina asked. Why did you assume I would? Melesio asked. Because I know you too well, Melesio. It's always like this with you. You can't just reject an idea. Moreover, you will probably be curious about why she decided to do this. Melesio, let's just let you continue with your work. I truly don't want you to get engaged in this conflict, Marcelina waved off. At that moment, Melesio immediately understood why she had changed her view like that. Apparently, his mother feared that in this whole race, Melesio would forgive Clara and everything would go back. Marcelina couldn't be happier that this girl was no longer part of the family. And what if it would all start again? Marcelina, as if answering her own mental question, shook her head negatively. You've been through too much lately. I'm sorry you endured such a blow, but I don't think you should continue struggling with all this, Marcelina said. Melesio went up to his apartment alone. Apparently, his mother took care of it and called a cleaning service. He knew how messy Clara could be. If she packed her things, she surely left a terrible mess behind. He didn't want to see a pile of garbage and scattered clothes. Everything here was the same as on the day he left, except for the missing belongings. The main thing was that it was clean, quiet, and peaceful. Everything was gone, even their photos. Clara deliberately took out the pictures, leaving empty frames on the wall. So it all ended like this, Melesio said. He sighed heavily and sat in the chair. After a bath, Melesio ordered sushi and turned on his favorite TV series. He tried not to think about anything, just to distract himself and calm down a bit. Somehow, various images of Clara kept flashing in his mind. He was afraid he would only remember the good things and wanted to reconcile with Clara. But his brain, as if intentionally, recalled the most foolish situations in their relationship. Melesio looked at them as if from the side, understanding that it was high time to end it all. Of course, there would be no wedding. 
Melesio called the manager they were going to hire and warned in advance that nothing would happen. Luckily, there was enough time. No one had done anything yet, not even sent out the invitations. A few days later, Melesio woke up to a strange sound. He raised his head and heard someone wandering around the living room. He got up slowly, approached the door, and then opened it abruptly. Out of surprise, Clara screamed, covered her face with her hands, and only after a few seconds realized what had happened. Oh my God! She exclaimed, staring at Melesio. It took her a moment to think about what was happening. She looked at him and seemed to be trying to comprehend that he was here, standing on his own two feet. You? I know everything about you and your lover. I know you were just trying to trick me into the wedding. You can spare me the act. You don't love me. It won't work anyway, the man insisted. She froze. Clara still didn't move, as if she were an exhibit in a wax figure museum. There was a rather strange feeling in her chest, as if it were not just anxiety growing. Then Clara straightened her back, sat on the sofa, and shook her head negatively. You don't know anything, she said. Melesio looked at her, thinking that she would now start making up excuses. He didn't even suspect that she was tired of playing cat and mouse and was about to reveal everything straightforwardly. When she started talking, Melesio became more engrossed in her story. However, thin notes of distrust still lingered in his soul. I don't have a lover. I was talking to my brother on the phone. So you decided to set me up, right? It's disgusting, Melesio, she said firmly. Disgusting? Don't you think you have too high an opinion of yourself? You were trying to trick me into getting married, and I behaved disgustingly. Melesio asked. At that moment, he realized he didn't have feelings for her. He didn't need to take the test to understand whether she was honest with him or not. It helped him understand whether he was honest with himself. Your late father is not really your father. He's my father, she said. Melesio froze. He stared at her, but Clara didn't rush to explain everything. She went to the kitchen, made herself coffee out of habit, and sat on a stool, looking out the window. You know, my mother died before he passed away. She told me that my father was a businessman. When my mom got pregnant, my dad was just a regular worker. But another guy was also interested in my mom, and my dad was unreliable. He showed up and then disappeared. My mom decided that it was better to choose this thug, but at least she would be with him, like behind a stone wall. She didn't say anything about the pregnancy. Clara took a deep breath. She traced a strange pattern on the tablecloth with her finger. Melesio listened to her without interrupting. He knew that Clara quickly lost her train of thought. He didn't want to disturb her unnecessarily. In short, after I was born, a few years later, they gave birth to my brother. But life didn't go well. My stepfather drank, and my mother stuck with him until he died, playing the savior, hoping she could save him. And my brother and I celebrated when he finally died. He wouldn't beat us anymore or invite his buddies in. My mother says my father became a big businessman. At almost the same time, he married a woman with a little child, practically a baby. So, this baby is you. He lived with this woman. And I just wanted to restore justice. To start with, get married with you to at least get a part of that money. He's my father, Clara said quietly. You have a rather illogical plan, Melesio said. I know that myself. Lately, everything has been dragging on. I really didn't cheat on you, Melesio. I was just terribly upset that my father lived in luxury while we shared a loaf of bread for a week. It hurt that you had everything, although you meant nothing to him. And I, his own daughter, just languished in poverty. Clara fell silent. Melesio simply nodded, realizing that he had nothing to say. On one hand, he understood that she was going through a tough time, but it all seemed strange. They said goodbye, yet nothing had been resolved. Just a day later, Melesio was already at his mother's house, recounting practically everything to her. He hoped that Marcelina would laugh it off and say it was all nonsense. He really wasn't your blood father. We wanted to have other children, 
but it didn't work out. We tried several IVF attempts, but nothing worked and I wasn't willing to go for surrogacy. He loved you very much as his own son. He never treated you differently, never said a word that you weren't his biological child, Marcelina spoke. She took out a bottle of wine, poured herself a glass, took a sip, and tears welled up in her eyes. I was very young and foolish, Melestio. You can easily calculate that I gave birth to you very early. When I got pregnant, your biological father tormented me and locked me up to prevent me from having an abortion. His relatives pressured me. In the end, I couldn't go through with the abortion, and when the time came, he just ran away. I had to carry you alone and work on my feet. I was terrified that you would be born sick, she said. Marcelina wiped away her tears. She took a deep breath to keep as if trying not to cry harder, then looked at her son and gently brushed a strand of hair from his forehead. When you were born, I fell in love with Alejandro. He was just a regular worker back then, but he accepted you as his own little baby. We worked side by side, took care of you, and started a business. I don't consider you not his own. He raised and educated you, Marcelina said. Melesio returned home completely shattered, trying to digest all the information he had received. He was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling, struggling to piece all these things together. Just recently, it seemed to him that everything revolved around his fiancée and the failed marriage. The situation was getting more complicated. Melesio felt like a fool, allowing himself to be manipulated. Of course, he had no intention of forgiving Clara, but talking to her was still necessary, especially since the girl herself realized the stupidity of the situation but couldn't back down. His mother was so distraught after their conversation that she couldn't even sustain a conversation anymore. The memories of her late husband were so vivid that sorrow overwhelmed her entirely. Marcelina only recovered a few days later. Melesio decided to meet Ada at a restaurant. He needed to talk to someone who knew everything. When he recounted everything to her, she just shrugged. It's all strange, but it sounds very much like the truth. Maybe you should still pay her some compensation and help her out somehow in life. I don't know, Ada said, shrugging. Help her in life? Melesio asked. Ada nodded. The restaurant had such an atmospheric, romantic vibe that their friendly meeting no longer resembled just that. The longer Melesio spent with Ada, the more he realized that he felt something more than just friendship towards her. This once again confirmed that he no longer felt anything for his fiancée. She also has the right to that money, doesn't she? Right? Just talk to her calmly, without a scandal, and agree on a specific amount. Let her and her brother go their own way, and you can focus on your business. If he had stayed her father back then, where would you be? Ada suggested. Melesio had never considered this situation from such an angle. He liked that Ada always found something to focus on to make the right decision. He was always in a state of conflict within himself. In business, he could make any decision, but in his personal life, everything seemed much more complicated. You don't have to provide for her for the rest of her life, but it would be a good gesture, like a memory of your father, just help her, settle things amicably, and that's it, she added. Melesio nodded. He tried to change the subject, and they didn't even notice how the meeting became romantic. Melesio went home to his apartment only early in the morning from Ada. He remembered their conversation again and what she suggested him to do. Actually, the option was excellent. The only thing was that Melesio didn't know how Clara would react to this. Clara was a strong person, and if she latched onto something, she could hold on until the end. He asked Clara to come to the office. Clara arrived as if nothing had happened. Not a single muscle moved when she saw Melesio in this office, where they had been so often together. It seemed like all her emotions were blocked, like those of a robot. Clara looked at him impassively, not even attempting to engage in a dialogue. I think we shouldn't see each other after everything that happened, Clara said. I've thoroughly analyzed everything you said. I've decided that it really seems like the truth. A lot of time has passed, and you and I won't be able to verify anything. So, I suggest you spend some money. 
I'll give you money and completely transfer one of the branches to your name. You and your brother can take control, earn, and run the business, Melesio said. Clara was surprised. It was immediately clear that she didn't expect such things from him. She looked into his eyes attentively, as if trying to find a catch there. Melesio just shrugged, as if showing that there was nothing surprising in his decision. After all I've done, you're giving me compensation? I knew you had a kind heart, but this is strange. Do you want to set me up later? Clara asked. Nonsense, you need to tone it down a bit and start trusting people, Melesio replied. If I had grown up like you, with a silver spoon in my mouth, then maybe I would have trusted people. You can't imagine what I've been through, Clara answered shortly. Melesio felt somewhat insignificant compared to her. Clara took a deep breath, as if she had calmed down a bit. He handed her the documents, which she promptly signed after reading them a few times. He created an account for her in the bank, transferred the sum there, and completely handed over the branch under her management. Now she could run her own business and no longer worry about the finances. He offered her lessons with a good mentor, but he feared she might refuse. Clara went to the mentor, took notes, and absorbed information like a sponge. It was immediately noticeable that she intended to take the matter seriously. However, they no longer communicated. Melesio didn't even feel resentment when he saw her or remembered their days together. When Teresa appeared in the office, Melesio was already free. She brought the final documents for him to sign and congratulated him on the broken engagement. In reality, Teresa came to say goodbye as she decided to permanently move to Japan. I'm really glad you're free from that. I understand it sounds strange when you're congratulated on a broken engagement at the very least. But seriously, if you had gotten involved with that girl, nothing good would have come out of it. I'm sorry for being so gleeful, but I know her inside out, Teresa said. Melesio nodded but didn't ask any more questions. They sat at the table, chatting like in the good old days, discussing business matters as if nothing had happened in their world. When I think about how we started, it's hard to imagine what we've become. You're all businesslike and truly an adult. You know, Melesio, when you got your father's business, I seriously doubted you could do anything, but now you're one of the most promising entrepreneurs in our region, Teresa said. Honestly, I had severe doubts about myself back then. You helped me a lot when you believed in me. Do you think I don't remember that? I remember everything well. Teresa, you, and Mom were the closest people to me at that time, and believe me, I'll never forget that. Even if you need help and support there in Japan, call me anytime, Melesio said with a smile. She hugged him, pressed against his chest tightly, and then let go forever. They shook hands for the last time, hoping to see each other someday. Soon everyone left the office, and Melesio was left alone. Teresa was one of his few friends. It was hard to lose a person to whom he was so attached. Until the end of the working day, Melesio tried to distract himself with business matters, but it was still sad that his whole story was falling apart, everything was changing. A few months ago, he had a good friend, a fiancé, and now there was nothing. There was really nothing to regret. Teresa decided to develop business abroad, which was really commendable. As for Clara, it was better to have no fiancé than one like her. Melesio was glad to see how Clara was trying to manage her small business. He hoped that she would have more strength and opportunities to scale it further. She was really making an effort, and he was glad that he had taken a step back. After work, Melesio went not home but to Ada's place. Her small apartment near the hospital seemed incredibly cozy to him. Ada had a lot of things, and there was little space in the rented apartment. Some unpacked boxes even stood around after a recent move, but for him, it was just part of the overall comfort they created together. Melesio lay on the bed, staring at the ceiling, feeling Ada snuggling up to him. These relationships were not at all like those with Clara. Ada was kind and, most importantly, simple. She had no excessive demands, she just lived and loved her life as it was. But most importantly, Melesio felt Ada was sincere, it was something he sorely missed. 
Marcelina was delighted when Ada became a part of their family. They quickly found common ground, and Marcelina was sure that this time her son had chosen a suitable partner. What do you think we should do next? Ada asked. What do you mean? Marcelo asked. Do we have a future, or do you just want to heal your soul after the breakup? I don't really want to be a puppet in your hands, but I can't step back now either, Ada said with a smile. He laughed at her conclusions. She smiled and looked at him. He was glowing with happiness. Ada slowly ran her palm along his cheek. He felt her love and her emotions. Melesio gently kissed her on the forehead, then laid down again, just as he was lying before. He didn't want to think about the future. He didn't need anything right now. He just wanted to feel happy, carefree, and peaceful for a moment. Do you want something specific? He asked. I just want us to be happy, Ada replied. Then we wish for the same thing, Melesio said. He hugged her tighter, grabbed the remote, and turned on the TV. They were lying on the bed together, watching a silly show, laughing. It felt as if the whole world ceased to exist for them. There were only the two of them, a small apartment on the outskirts of the town, and the love they had pledged to keep for each other. Do you want to join me in volunteering one of these days? We provide free medical care and feed the homeless. It's not a cheerful activity, but it heals the soul, she suggested. If I have free time on that day, then yes, of course. I might not be able to stay for the whole day, but I can spend a few hours at least, maybe sponsor some part of it, he said. That would be great. We're running out of basic medicines. I'm really glad that you want to get involved in all of this, Ada said. You love it, you find it interesting, and that makes it important for me too, he said with a smile. Melesio kissed her, and she smiled. Now they had to wait for the day when he would first go to the volunteer center. Melesio had no idea of the changes it would bring about. On the day he was supposed to participate in the volunteer movement, Melesio felt anxious in the morning. It seemed like he could barely find his place. He was extremely nervous, frequently shifting from one leg to the other. Inside him, he felt heavy anxiety. Melesio always paid attention to his inner emotions, but today he couldn't refuse Ada. He arrived at the volunteer center, bringing money and medications, and even stood on the distribution line himself. He noticed a few people with phones and already knew that, unfortunately, there would be photos circulating on the internet tomorrow. No, he wasn't ashamed, rather, he was proud of his actions. But he really hoped it wouldn't turn into a big deal. Young man, please, an old man said. Melesio looked up and saw an elderly, sick man. It was evident that he was homeless. A black, disheveled puppy with different colored eyes peeked out from his armpit. Could you put a bit more bread in? This is Lola, the man said with a smile. Melesio smiled back at him, added a few more pieces of bread, and handed them to the elderly man. The homeless man sat at the table, dipped the bread in the soup, and handed it to the puppy. Lola eagerly devoured the rare meal. The man felt a tightening inside him, a fear. More than anything, he was afraid to end up like this, homeless and unwanted. Suddenly, the man slumped forward. Everyone screamed. He obviously wasn't feeling well. Ada called an ambulance. They quickly loaded the man into the ambulance and took him away within minutes. He needed a rare blood type, and when Nalesio found out that their blood types matched, he immediately agreed. You two look so alike. Melesio, what if Ada began, but she didn't finish her sentence? They were standing in the corridor, waiting to see what would happen next. Melesio held little Lola in his arms, though it was strictly prohibited to bring any animals into the hospital. He just couldn't leave the small, helpless puppy alone. Who knew? Maybe the little one wouldn't make it until the owner returned. Let's not start this conversation, he said. Why not? Just do a DNA test, and that's it. Can you imagine what a miracle that would be? What if he's really your father? Ada exclaimed in amazement. Melesio simply shook his head. He didn't like this idea at all. He wasn't going to turn his life into a reality show. 
A father is the one who raised and nurtured you. My father's name is Alejandro. I don't need another one. It won't change anything anyway, he said. Melesio left the hospital, heading towards his car. Ada stayed at work. He stopped by a large pet store, bought everything necessary, and made sure the little puppy was comfortable, a bed, a bunch of toys, a small leash, and a collar, likely one that could be adjusted as Lola grew. When he brought the small creature into the apartment, he couldn't believe that he now had a pet. Of course, Lola was here temporarily, she had an owner, and perhaps they were each other's only close friends. Early in the morning, Melesio woke up to a phone call. Ada called from the hospital to say that the man had passed away. It turned out he was seriously ill, and no blood transfusion would have saved him. Melesio looked at the small black puppy, sleeping soundly, cuddling against his side. He had no idea how the puppy managed to climb onto the bed. Melesio stroked its fur, thinking that it was now truly his pet. When Marcelina entered her son's apartment, she warmly hugged the little puppy. Lola was happy with the new acquaintance, too. Imagine how strange it is. All this time, she lived on the street starving, and now she has a luxurious apartment and premium food, his mother said, laughing. People with an average salary save up or take a loan to get a dog for 5000 and you have a lot of money but get yourself a homeless one. His mother laughed at her harmless joke, and Melesio chuckled as well. Lola barked, as if understanding that they were talking about her. When mother and son sat down at the table, Melesio handed his mother the phone with a picture of the homeless man. Marcelina stared at the person's face, barely able to understand if she knew him or not. We have a rare blood match, and Ada says we look alike, Melesio said. Melesio, I think you're chasing the ghosts of the past. You're not the only one with that blood type. There's nothing surprising here. I'm sorry you found out about your father's story so unexpectedly, and I didn't tell you earlier. I won't recognize the person in the photo, perhaps it's your biological father, who has changed a lot. But I feel that if he were your biological dad, I would recognize him even after all these years. Although life presents different situations, Marcelina said. She took the coffee from her son and sat at the table, swinging her leg. The puppy was lying on her lap, sweetly dozing, while she was stroking it and smiling. You've changed a lot. You got a dog, finally chose a good girl, and engaged in volunteering. All the local groups are filled with your photos. I know you don't like publicity, but you can't escape it. Anyway, it will positively impact your business, Marcelina said, shrugging. He looked at her, but didn't know what to say. In truth, Melesio wasn't thrilled about all these photos. He wished his volunteer activities wouldn't be so prominently displayed. He was doing it for himself and for other people, not to entertain the public. You know, I see how well you've settled here and how you're dedicated to your work. I might stop traveling back and forth, get myself a dog too, and visit the shelter today. It's time to settle down and love, Marcelina said, gently stroking the puppy's head. Don't you have any plans to get married? You're still young, Mom, he said with a smile. Marcelina laughed, then tousled her son's hair. He loved it when she did that. This gesture reminded him of his childhood. You know, I thought about it not long ago, but it's impossible. I loved and still love your father very much. Alejandro was a wonderful person. I doubt I'll meet anyone else. I'll carry this love through my entire life, she said with a smile. Melesio didn't press for a different answer. It was nice to realize that his parents loved each other so much. On the other hand, he really wished his mother would find another close person. They were sitting in the kitchen, chatting, and playing with the little puppy. Melesio looked at the dog and thought that somewhere up there, a little guardian angel had given this puppy a wonderful life. Two days later, Clara showed up at the office. She brought a whole box of gifts that Melesio had given her. Clara no longer looked as confident and audacious as she did on the day he revealed the cards to her. Now she seemed more like a slightly intimidated girl. Are you into volunteering now? Clara asked, standing in front of his desk, holding the box with both hands. 
Photos are everywhere, and they say the young millionaire is not ashamed of his hobby. Hobby? I wish they'd chosen a different word. You know, I'm not at all happy with those headlines, Melesio said. Clara nodded. She placed the large box on the table and shook her head. Melesio knew she was gearing up for a conversation. Now, she looked natural and simple. Maybe if she had been like this from the beginning, he would have fallen for her much harder. I brought all your gifts. I don't think it's necessary to keep them. I didn't deserve them. Listen, Melesio. Clara paused. She sat down, looking at her own feet, afraid to lift her eyes to him. He smiled as soon as she looked at him. He hoped she would relax a bit and express herself. I'm really sorry for what I did, truly. I'm terribly ashamed of it. Sometimes, I think it's all because of my stupidity. It was horribly hurtful to see how well you live. But when we were together, I felt this awful sense of injustice inside me. You didn't deserve all that I did. I'm terribly ashamed. I'm really not that kind of person, Clara said. Clara. No, wait. I really want you to have a good impression of me. You gave us money and a business. My brother and I are thriving. We have a chance for a good future. It's all thanks to you, Melesio. I just want you to understand that I'm not really a bad person. I just want everything to be good for you, Clara said through tears. Melesio stood up, approached her, and hugged her tightly. Clara burst into tears and continued to apologize, choking on her tears. It was evident how sincerely she regretted her behavior. Even Melesio felt ashamed that she was so upset because of him. When the girl finally caught her breath, she was able to speak again. She was already smiling. It was clear how she had relieved her soul. However, he didn't take her gifts. Clara was standing with the box, looking inside, then at him. I know you're planning to get married. Rumors spread quickly, Melesio. I truly wish you happiness. If you can, please forgive me for everything, she said. I have already forgiven, Melesio said. As a farewell, he hugged her tightly, opened the office door, and knew that he probably wouldn't see her again in such a context. Maybe they would communicate about business, but any other contacts were out of question. The wedding took place two months after that conversation. Unlike Clara, who chose everything expensive and best, Ada was not so fixated on money. She opted for a simple white evening dress and skipped the wedding celebration. They signed the papers, had a beautiful photo shoot with a rented, truly royal, luxurious dress that was Melesio's choice, and then simply sat in a restaurant with their closest people. When Melesio and Ada visited Marcelina, there was no longer that strange feeling of unease. Melesio knew there would be no arguments, they got along perfectly. He just wanted to enjoy some time at his parents' home. They brought little Lola with them because now she had a friend at his mother's house. How nice that you came. I've already prepared a bedroom for you. I didn't expect you to stay for so many days. I'm so happy, Marcelina said. When Ada went upstairs, Marcelina took her son's hand. He recounted everything that happened during the conversation with Clara. Marcelina just nodded, looking meaningfully into her son's eyes. I'm very proud of you for what you did, giving her a chance to succeed in life, not taking back the gifts, and forgiving her after all that. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about her too. Maybe she's not such a bad person after all. She left you in a coma just because she didn't want to give you any false hope. Even then, she understood how awful she was behaving. You know, I met with her recently, Marcelina said. When? When you had already talked to her. For some reason, I decided that I needed to talk to her. We met in a cafe. She had been crying almost the entire time, apologizing and saying that she's really not that kind of person. Even then, I realized that she was behaving sincerely. It's a pity I was so hard on her. On the other hand, I forgave her too, Marcelina said. Melesio nodded. It was nice to know that the girl had received forgiveness from two people. Surely, her life would take a turn for the better after these conversations. 
Marcelina patted her son's shoulder firmly. You chose an amazing woman for yourself. Ada is kind, caring, and sincere. Besides, your life has changed quite a bit since she came along. I'm very glad that you get along so well, living soul to soul, just like Alejandro and I used to. I hope everything goes well for you in your personal life, Marcelina said. When Ada started to descend the stairs, Marcelina fell silent. She smiled, inviting Ada to the table. I was just telling your husband how lucky he is to be with you. He became much gentler and more sensitive when he started living with you. And after the wedding, I think he became even gentler. He has been through so much. You came to him as a reward. I mean that in a good way, Marcelina said. The girl was completely embarrassed. Ada's cheeks turned pink. He loved watching his wife blush. There was something cute and modest about it. Ada changed the subject of the conversation. But when she and Melesio finally reached the crucial point of the conversation, both of them chickened out. We should have said it right away, Ada said. We'll tell her tomorrow, Melesio replied. He approached his wife, circled her from behind, and tenderly placed his hands on her stomach. They had come to delight Marcelina that she would become a grandmother, but they got so excited that they never shared the joyful news. The next day, when Marcelina learned that she would become a grandmother, she jumped around like a young girl. She laughed, clapped her hands, and hugged them, thanking them for such a splendid gift. Marcelina was happy that their lives would become even more joyful and fulfilling now. Without children, there is no family. Oh, how happy I am for you, dears. When you lived for each other, it seemed like that was enough, but when a child is born, your life will change drastically. And believe me, you'll never feel the love that you'll feel for the little one with anyone else. It's like a different level of emotion. I want you to feel it and understand it. I want you to be happy. I'll be a grandmother. Marcelina shouted. Melesio was glad to see his mother literally glowing with happiness. She radiated it as if she had been waiting for this news for many years. Melesio hugged Ada. When they both found out they would become parents, they were so overjoyed that, for some time, they were afraid to tell anyone. They decided that Marcelina would be the first to learn the joyful news about their family. Now they were sitting at the table, talking about children and their future. All of them were absolutely happy to be together as a family. Melesio, from time to time, recalled his past, the situation with Clara, the biological father. Now it all seemed so insignificant and unimportant compared to his current life that he regretted wasting emotions on it. The main thing was that he had a family, and that was the most valuable treasure in life. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.